Good afternoon. Very, I am very excited to be here and share some of my life's journey, stories, and learnings along the way. I grew up in India, I had a very unusual childhood, which involved spending hours and hours and hours with my dad uh, watching animals. By the time I was two, I had seen my first tiger and leopard. By the time I was eight, I was tracking tigers with him. And uh, along the way, I learned to appreciate how truly extraordinary India is, not just for its people and its cultures, but the incredible wildlife we have uh, in the country. I didn't want to be a wildlife scientist or conservationist. I did appreciate science because both of my parents have PhDs. And so I knew someday I wanted to be a Dr. Karan. I just wasn't sure in what. What I didn't want to do was get into wildlife. And this is particularly because during my teenage years, I saw my father and several of his colleagues being uh, harassed, hounded for the difficult challenges they took on in conservation, whether, involved, whether it involved shutting down an iron ore mine, uh, taking on poachers or asking the sometimes hard questions that governments need to be asked. This kind of left a very deep impression on me because I didn't want to grow up uh, and, and I have a career where you're constantly battling uh, people and the government. What's interesting today is ironically, I've kind of found my way back um, to wildlife and conservation. This happened when I was doing my master's uh, at Yale. I came back to India in 2002 to design a project that looked at human, wildlife, human impacts on Badra Wildlife Sanctuary and had this amazing time doing field work in the, uh, in the mountains uh, of Badra. And I realized that my interest was actually the human dimensions of conservation, which is looking at how people and wildlife intersect and realized there was an opportunity there to look at solutions, look at threats and create opportunities for people to live with wildlife in a more, um, I hate the word coexistence, but sustainable manner. And so for the last 24 years, I've been a scientist and conservationist. As a woman scientist and conservationist, I think the challenges are much more than if you were a man. Uh, if you looked at the previous generation of uh, men and women in India, there were very few women who chose to uh, pursue a, pr a profession that involved being uh, in the jungle for hours on end in really remote lo locations doing very difficult field work. And uh, perhaps in the older generations, there was a dismissal of women saying, you're not strong enough, tough enough to live uh, in remote areas for months on end and do this kind of work. Fortunately, a lot of that has changed. If you look at the profession today, I would say there are equal number of men and women pursuing this uh, profession. And I think that's a great thing. What is needed though, I think is greater support for younger women in the profession, because when you choose to have a family uh, without a supportive network, you see a huge dropout of young women uh, because they're not able to uh, provide for their children and do this kind of work in really, really difficult conditions. So I think we've made a lot of progress, but we can do a lot more. Um, for me personally, I made a decision to actually have a child during uh, my PhD. And this ended up being pretty complicated because although I was in the US uh, and you think there were progressive uh, uh, systems in place to support somebody who are making this choice, I found it very, very difficult. I almost had no uh, support uh, with my daughter and I had to kind of juggle the two. And I think uh, these kind of things have to fundamentally change whether you work in India or work in the US that when people choose to have a family, you allow them the space uh, to care for the child and then come back into a profession. To me, the other big thing has been, you know, uh, as a scientist, we always use evidence and numbers to do our work. Uh, and although the passion for conservation comes from deep emotions because you care for a particular animal or a particular place, at the end, uh, decisions in wildlife, like many other fields, 
need to be based on data and evidence. I see that severely lacking today. Uh, colleagues of mine and, and, and myself, when we go to present uh, our findings are still sort of dismissed and the science side of it is still not taken seriously. So I think uh, we continue need to continue to kind of promote women in science and science broadly uh, to become a mainstream part of society. But a large part of my passion is also not about people, right? It's about wildlife. Um, I was very fortunate to start my Ananta Aspen journey last year as a fellow. And one thing that struck me is that when you're sitting in a room of fellows uh, who are talking about making people's lives better, uh, there's got to be more than that, right? Uh, we share the planet with an extraordinary array of species, many of whom are capable of emotions and connections and um, a ways of living that we attribute to humans. But I think there's enough examples of species uh, that demonstrate, whether it be elephants, whether it be dolphins, that demonstrate the higher thinking attributed to people. And so for me, when I look at the world, when I look at environmental concerns today, um, I don't necessarily see it from a human lens. I think uh, we have extraordinary decision-making powers and the onus is on us um, is to make sure that these decisions are made with other life in consideration. Uh, there's a wonderful book where we uh, called by Mark Linus called the God species. And I think we are the God species, but we have to take responsibility for those decisions that we're making and realize that the planet was not created just for people. So I think uh, when you talk about leveling, uh, whether it's leveling for people of all kinds of origins across gender, uh, the leveling to me has to happen about, uh, has to happen across life uh, between people and animals. I run a nonprofit uh, based in Bangalore called Center for Wildlife Studies. Over the last uh, 40 years, we've done pioneering work on wildlife research, conservation, education, and storytelling with the mission to save wildlife and wild places in India. One of the key things I realized uh, about 10 years ago is when we started doing research on human wildlife conflict, we worked in over 3,000 villages documenting people's interactions with nature. And the one that stood out is not the positive or the neutral, but the negative interactions. And this focuses on loss. And what do I mean by loss? It's people um, losing crops to elephants and pigs. It's people being injured uh, or killed in confrontations with bears or elephants. It's people losing livestock to tigers and leopards. And our research established very early on that uh, this is very widespread and common in India. About 80 to 100,000 incidents are reported to the government of India. Uh, our estimate is that only 30% of incidents are actually reported. So you're talking probably 300 to 500,000 incidents per year where uh, a human being and an animal come into some kind of confrontation and things go bad on both sides or one side. What I also realized is that, um, that we could help uh, make the situation better. So we designed and implemented several conservation programs today. Uh, they're called Wild Seve, Wild Shale, and Wild Surakshe. I'd like to talk about the Wild Shale program. Uh, this is a conservation education program uh, that we started in 2018 because we realized that children living next to wildlife parks in India actually live in uh, fear of big animals. They were not excited to see tigers or elephants. They had very difficult memories or they were uninterested in, in wildlife. And I very strongly believe that unless you connect to a place and these extraordinary animals, you're not gonna help uh, conserve them in the long term. So we launched a conservation education program which works with children between age, ages 10 and 13 uh, with the goals of increasing interest uh, in wildlife and wild places with building empathy uh, for 
animals and then for to give them basic safety coping mechanisms of if they're in a conflict situation what are the basic do's and don'ts the program has been extremely successful we've reached over uh, 21000 children in over 500 schools in maharashtra karnataka and tamil nadu uh, the pandemic obviously brought that to a uh, immediate um, halt and we're now restarting the program but what it's taught us is that we were able to increase knowledge uh, we were able to increase uh, interest and more than anything else we were able to increase empathy indian children are highly empathetic and i think this is something we lose as we grow into being adults and it's really essential that we create opportunities to create empathy and that i think will be the foundation to saving wildlife and wild places in india thank you